One of the things I like to do in these kinds of talks is to begin with the definition of research because I think we're all pretty comfortable with the notion that it involves a methodical study of a subject. Um, usually we think of it in terms of making new discovery, learning new facts. We think of it in terms of revising or creating a hypothesis. But my favorite definition of research adds another element. And that's the element of taking action on what you have learned. And I hope you'll see as I go through um, the next few moments with you that this is something that I've, I've tried to put into practice as well. So one of the questions people always ask me is, when did I know I wanted to be a scientist? Um, when did I know that this was the path that I wanted to continue down my journey on? And the real answer in terms of making a hard decision was not until I started as an undergraduate because I was in love with ancient history and classical languages, but I was also in love with science. So as I look back on my life, I can now see lots of threads that brought me to this time and place. Um, one of those threads is when I was about nine years old, I discovered the world of dinosaurs, as most children do, and I couldn't get enough reading about this. I talked with my aunts and uncles about it and anyone who would listen to me. And I was actually quite, um, quite fascinated with the concept of cavemen. And it was one of the first times that I had this sense that there was something that I wasn't getting in the stories. And so I went to my pastor and I asked him, can you tell me where these dinosaurs and monsters fit in to the story of the creation of our world? Because I couldn't find it there. And this caused me a great concern. So I kind of went away and he said, let me think about it for a while, which by the way, I've learned is always a really good strategy when you're asked a difficult question. Let me think about it for a while. He came back later and offered me a very interesting explanation that actually merged um, kind of classical uh, theology with an understanding of, of evolutionary biology. And that actually is one of the threads that as I look back, I can see being something that has brought me um, along. It's been a, a longstanding interest of, I've had. Life, where does it begin? How does it begin? How does it change? And so that probably is the underlying fundamental question that I was interested in. But I think research is kind of inherent in the state of being human. If you take a microscope to a kindergarten class and leave it there for a week, you will not be surprised to learn that every single child brings something to look at, brings something to try to understand about um, the structure of something or how does it look at a close level. So I think this desire to understand things is, is inherent in us as humans. And I also like to remind people that it's not limited to scientists. I mean, in fact, the person who studies an original folio of Shakespeare and creates a presentation on this stage is every much a researcher as the person who stands at a bench and isolates DNA and sequences it. So we need to have a more flexible understanding of what research entails. And the reason I go to that understanding, or at least having common ground and common language with people like writers and poets and philosophers, is that one never knows where one's research will go. And as I've tried to take action on the things I've learned, I've found repeatedly that I'm drawn to these highly interdisciplinary collaborations where I'm working with people who are far outside of my field. And we need to together create a new framework of thinking about a problem. I'm trained as a classical geneticist. I spent at least half of my research career pushing fruit flies around sorting them out under a microscope, taking a bunch of them, grinding them up, and doing something with what was left. Understanding something about the structure and function and evolution of the hereditary material of fruit flies. And that's my classic background. 
When I was moving into establishing my own research trajectory, it was in the earliest days of being able to isolate genes and to sequence them. And so I became interested in this segment of DNA, which is not a single gene. I think most of us think about genes, think about heredity as being a single gene. We inherit one from our mother and one from our father, and they work together to produce some outcome. I have found myself interested in a very different set of genes, and these are genes that are present tens or hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands of time in our human DNA. And they provide an especially challenging set of research questions. So my first research endeavors were to understand how these very complicated, large families of genes come into being. What are the forces that maintain them? How are they regulated? How do they contribute to the blueprint that becomes an organism? In studying those genes, I learned a lot about the basic mechanisms that control both their creation and their function. And as I began moving from fruit flies into humans, I carried the knowledge I had learned in studying flies and brought it into new areas, such as human DNA typing in the context of forensics. And so these same gene families I've talked about that are repeated thousands and hundreds of thousands, perhaps even millions of times, can be very small, a few bases, or they can be gigantic, hundreds of thousands of bases. The smallest ones are the basis for forensic DNA typing. And in forensic DNA typing, we're actually measuring in every person the signature of these small repeated sequences. Doing that, we can tell every person in this room apart from every other person in this room. This was the foundational work that we had done with my students that brought state archaeologist Nick Bellantoni to my door. I was away at a conference. I came back from the conference. One of the people in my lab came out and said to me, um, you need to call Nick Bellantoni. And I said, yes, I know. I got an email while I was in Washington. I'm, I'm going to get right to him. No, you need to call him immediately. And I said, well, what is this about? And she said, there's Hitler skulls in our lab. <laughs> and everyone was sort of in, you know, all up in arms. So you need to be flexible. And what happened in this case is I called upon two of my former students who are experts in doing this kind of very challenging DNA typing, Craig O'Connor and Heather Nelson who now work at the office of the chief medical examiner in New York City. They came and we worked on these very badly degraded, burned, little tiny chips of DNA. What we were able to find is, although the DNA was very badly degraded, we could look at the smallest repeated marker that we had. And it was able to tell us that this skull was from a woman and not from a man. That alone would have been interesting, but when we combined it with Nick's work, in which he determined that when he examined the actual skull in Moscow, and not just these little shards that came back to Yukon, he thought that the skull was the wrong size, wrong shape, and had the wrong characteristic to be a male of Hitler's age. So one of the things I think is important to recognize about DNA, whether it's in a crime scene or in historical thing, as we talked about here, it's only when it's combined with other evidence that it really becomes powerful. And so it was very important that Nick and I had known each other and had worked with each other before, beginning with the documentation of the family of a former slave, Venture Smith, and his family. So these repeated genes that we've talked about are now allow allowing me to do other things. In collaboration with my colleague Patricia Diaz out at the School of Dental Medicine, we're using these repetitive gene families to try to understand how people who are undergoing chemotherapy develop these horrible, horrible oral lesions. And we're trying to understand the role that fungus might play in that. 
And we're actually able to use these marvelous new tools in my field of genetics and genomics to do things we would never have thought of before. And I'll give you an example of this. Until a decade or so ago, the only way to study this problem would have been to take a scraping or a swab from the mouth of a person who has this lesion, plate it out on a plate, grow the thing up, and see what's there. The problem with this approach is that a large fraction of fungi are not able to be cultured. They can't exist outside of whatever habitat they live in. So when we do that experiment, what we learn are the fungi that are easily seen and that are known. Using these marvelous new instruments that we have in the Center for Applied Genetics and Technology, we can take a swab, process it, sequence, and get hundreds of thousands of DNA sequences. We can then match that to known databases and we can identify things that cannot be cultured. We will identify brand new things that have never been seen before. And then the hope is that we can use this information to find out what the underlying root causes are of this development. And the ultimate hope is that one can then take action based on what you learn and be proactive about finding out ways that you can prevent this. Because this is a huge human tragedy as well as um, an interesting scientific question. So that's in a very quick waltz the kinds of things I'm interested in and that I do. What inspires me to do this stuff is simple. It's the young people I work with when I do it. That's what makes me want to get up every morning. That's what makes me want to continue. So I thank you very much for your attention, and I would be pleased to answer any questions if you have any.